What's going on guys? It's Omniarch and today I'm with 12 inch PV penis and we're gonna bring you our guide on how to find the best kingdom to migrate to in Rise of Kingdoms. So migrating is a question that I get asked all the time on live streams. People ask me this question in the comment section of my videos and I wanted to bring on 12 inch over here. Uh, I talked about him in my last video. I gave him a shout out. If you guys didn't check that out, definitely go ahead and check that out. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey guys, I am a completely free to play player. Uh, I hit T5 on day 273 of my free to play run. And I'm currently holding uh, a Zenith, of power skin and a KVK skin. Um, and you know, I, I also get asked a lot about migration and me and Omni, we're just going to throw you guys through some points on how we did it yeah so it sounds like you have better skins than me honestly to be completely fair <laughs> um so i was actually really excited when he brought up this idea because like i said people ask me this question a lot and i haven't planned out this type of video so i threw in a couple of bullet points into some of the things that he mentioned um it looks like we have 13 bullet points that we're going to be going over here and i'm going to pass it to you for the first one so the first thing that i look for when i go into you know the the search for a new kingdom you know whether i'm dissatisfied with my kingdom or i'm looking at a a new kvk you know if i want light versus darkness or i want some more kvk too uh, the first thing I'm looking for is for sure an international kingdom. I think having uh, multiple languages is really good, but most of all, uh, covering the time zones is really good. I think that minimum for diplomacy is you're going to want an English speaking alliance and you're going to want a Korean speaking alliance, especially if you're in KVK2, because there's so many powerful Koreans so early. Yeah, I think that's that's really important if you're, like you said, in KVK, um, if if you have a big push at one time and then nobody's on after that, it doesn't really matter, you know? Yeah, because you'll you'll backslide everything. It just means you need to push twice as hard while you're on and it's better to just keep it consistent. Right. So the second thing that I look for is a king rotation. The reason why king rotation is so important is because number one, it shows trust in the different alliances and it means that the different alliances can pull in uh, recruits. And, you know, this doesn't really apply for Imperium Kingdoms because for Imperium Kingdoms, you know, you only get a certain amount of tokens. Uh, per month right. versus for a non-imperium kingdom you know if they want to pull in a couple t5 players here and there it's important that they can do that and there's enough trust in the kingdom uh to show that it's stable and it's also really good that multiple people can pay for buffs even if they're paying for it using their farm accounts the fact that everybody is kind of sharing the burden of it is good and shows more trust in the kingdom yeah it's it's more of a cooperation thing and that kind of leads me to another point that i wanted to throw in there which is uh, organizing titles uh, this is something that's super important especially if you're still growing your account making sure that you have somebody on at all times to give you a title whether it's like for research or training or whatever um, having that organized and having a chat and then kind of giving rewards to those players who are spending hours at a time kind of just sitting there waiting to hand those out i think that's really important and something that you should definitely look for when you're considering where you should be going yeah, I mean, 100%. Uh, you know, whether it's it's kingdom rewards or resource rewards, uh, title giving should be encouraged. And if somebody is getting a a title that, like a kingdom title that can give other people rewards, it shouldn't be, you know, somebody shouldn't be simping for somebody and just giving them queen or giving them general. Right. You know, it should always be towards giving the whole kingdom titles. Yeah, 100% agree. Uh, the next point here uh, is going to be over guardian times. So this might seem uh, less relevant to older players, but towards you know newer beginner players, Temple Guardians are really, really important for everybody that doesn't have all commanders at level 60. The experience is just super important, especially for your first or second KVK. You know, you're gonna be looking for a kingdom that has one set of guardians twice a day, plus limited troops on the temple. You're gonna be looking for about uh, 20,000 or 50,000 because there's so many people that should be going to kill the guardians every day that you know you want everybody to be able to catch up. Uh, this is not the biggest thing ever, but it kind of plays into a larger role. If your kingdom can't even set up guardian times properly, there are probably bigger issues in leadership. So this is just something you should look for as a uh, idea of organization in your kingdom. Yeah, it's definitely an indicator of how, how much they've organized every little micro optimization that they can. All right. And the next thing on this list is going to be over MGE. So sometimes for kingdoms, you know, they, they want to rig MGE. And that might be stronger for the kingdom but for you personally when you're looking for a kingdom 
you're going to want to be looking for a mighty governor event that is not uh rigged especially if you're a low spender or a free-to-play player you know without t5 it's really really difficult for you to win a mightiest governor event and if you are a free-to-play or low spender tier five you're going to want the ability to be able to win an event and have it not be limited towards the highest vendors although i say that that being rigged is probably bad for you overall it should be stated that kill event itself should be limited because kill event itself kills the kingdom it's not something you should be looking forward and even worse than killing the kingdom is you'll have t1 feeders and that will absolutely shred your kingdom's resources and uh probably give sculptures to the wrong people realistically uh rig continue no, I was just gonna say so you so you think that um since it's so hard for a free to play player to win that event, you think if if they are able to save up enough resources and speed ups and stuff, they should have that option of of going all in and, and winning at that event because they've they've you know had the patience and they kinda deserve that win. For sure. I, I think that giving people the the illusion, you know, because some people will never win a Mightiest governor, it is what it is. But giving people the idea that they can, if they really wanted to, or they could try if they really wanted to, is really important for morale. I think that if you're lower power players, you know, your, your 10 to 30 mils that are feeding rallies and feeding flags and feeding passes, if they think that the kingdom is against them, they will have less of an incentive to fight for the kingdom and your kingdom cohesion and morale will overall go down. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The next point we want to talk about is the activity of the kingdom. So you want to be migrating to a kingdom that is as active as possible. Um, we're talking about doing forts all day. Uh, we're thinking probably at least one chest per day for forts uh, and really optimizing the number of people that you're sending to these rallies. For example, if you fill a rally to take down a level five fort, that's kind of a waste of AP, right? Because you have more than enough players to take down that fort if you had half sure. the rally, right? So somebody could just start another rally on a different fort and spend the same amount of AP. Uh, and so really maximizing the amount of fort rewards that you're getting uh, every single day is gonna help not only everybody, um, the Alliance, the Alliance gift level and things like that, but it's gonna help low spenders and free to play players the most. Um, and on top of that, uh, gift level is really important for the alliance that you're joining. Um, hopefully you can find yourself in, a, in an alliance that's getting a lot of gold chests. That's kind of like the dream, yeah. right? Getting those rewards for absolutely nothing. Um, maybe landing yourself an alliance that can get, I don't know, three or six gold chests per day is, is probably a really nice sweet spot. You have maybe one or two, uh, whales that are spending a decent amount every single day. Yep. Get a, getting a lot of VIP points to help your VIP. Uh, another thing that I'd like to say is like with the with the idea of not overfilling rallies for forts, if you have a kingdom that has rules where, you know, this is specifically for alliances within kingdoms, but you know, if they're requiring like two or three man filled forts, that's really, really good because it's you only get one chest per fort. So overfilling it really uh, is an overall waste of AP. That's a great point. Right. Yeah, that's something that my kingdom does, and I know that I, ne I never really thought about it too much until then, and I was like, okay, yeah, I can see why they would do that. Um, and on, t on top of that, as far as activity goes, uh, another thing you want to look for is the ability to participate in Ark of Osiris. This is more of like an alliance tip uh, again but at the same time you know it depends on how kingdoms are structured uh you want to be able to do arc of osiris every single time that it comes around and if that means going to a farm alliance or you know figuring out a way that you can participate in some way as a low power player um those free heads whether you win or you lose those are just too important uh, for your progression to to kind of give up i mean i i, I really like that because as as bigger players or older players uh i suppose we kind of take for granted you know we see ark of osiris once every two weeks and we just we just do it but there are players out there that are actively not doing ark of osiris and if if you are watching this video uh you should definitely hop into a farm alliance or go to any alliance that will take you because even if you lose you're getting six heads i think it's five uh, five heads yeah. for ten thousand points i mean ten thousand points you can farm it out get yourself five sculptures Win or lose, it's always a dub, uh, and you should always be trying to do Ark of Osiris. Your kingdom should facilitate that. Right. So for the next point here, for number six, is I think equality of the top two to four alliances power-wise is really important, or if there's one really top-heavy alliance. And, you know, giving context to this, I obviously, if there's a very top-heavy alliance, 
there's basically no chance of a civil war if there's an eight bill power alliance and a couple four bills because they'll never be able to stand up. So if you're in the eight bill alliance, you're generally always safe and you're going to get a bunch of rewards. Um, but if there is a bunch of equal, uh, equally powered alliances, there's either going to be, you know, mutually assured destruction to where they're, they're not going to want to plunge the kingdom in civil war or, uh, some of the top alliances will side with each other. And if there is a civil war, it'll be quick. The aggressors will be dissolved and then they'll hop into the, the whatever's left essentially, and there won't be too much damage. But if you have uh, one alliance that is maybe 7 billion power, and you have a couple, like three or four alliances that are 5 billion power, uh, depending on how the teams are, it could be a long and drawn out civil war, which is exactly what you don't want if you're a free to play player or low spender, because you can't afford shields. And you really don't want to be fighting over something that is not giving it. Right, at that point, it's it's basically just a waste of troops, right? Because you're wasting your troops, killing troops of people that you're going to be fighting alongside and four weeks you know what i mean it's kind of stupid the next thing i was going to say uh is going to be your kvk history or the kingdom's kvk history you want to see kind of like how they've been solving their problems or how they've been winning um you know whether they they win versus diplomacy whether they conquer everybody if they won their first kvk if they won their second you know if they're in second place how they have have looked in their track rest record of kvk this is especially dangerous when you're looking at people who absolutely stomped in kvk1 because kvk1 is a recruitment drive you know if you get a ton of t5 players it really doesn't matter how you play it your battle experience or your commanders you'll just absolutely stomp the other seven kingdoms and take everything however you know those same kingdoms will go against imperium kingdoms in kvk2 get absolutely stomped and explode so you're generally not looking for a conquering kingdom. Uh, you know, if there's a kingdom that was like third place in total kingdoms for KVK1 and used diplomacy to get Zig rewards, that kingdom probably has incredible leadership and that's something you should really be looking for. Yeah, and it's funny, we were going over this point uh, before we started recording and I was talking about how the kingdom that I came from, um, we actually lost, the. you guys know if you watch the videos on this, but... Um, we, we, I migrated out about halfway through, uh, and that kingdom we joined was a kingdom that uh, performed really, really well in KVK1, and that was kind of one of the things that we looked at when we were migrating to that kingdom, like, okay, well, they perform really well here, um, and then we kind of found out that steamrolling in KVK1 doesn't necessarily translate into good experience for KVK2, um, and that's kind of, it goes exactly to your point, and it's kind of... Uh, an experience that I've I've gone through personally, and so it's it's definitely important to realize that diplomacy is far more important than uh, just just raw numbers when it comes to looking at that first KVK. For sure, I mean it's almost like counterintuitive when you see like how hard some of these people stomp in the first KVK, and then how hard they get stomped in the second KVK, and it's just it, it is an, an issue with the way uh, continent placement works because it's has nothing to do with power in KVK one, but in KVK two. The brackets are very strictly defined by power and the the next point here is going to be over alliance relations uh so kingdoms have a lot of skeletons in their closet okay when you get there they have not been angels their whole life you know they they've probably axed one or two alliances or uh you know they're they're refugees from another kingdom that got uh stomped out and so what you want to be looking for is you want to look for if the aggressors won if they're still there because it, you, look, if a kingdom is full of aggressors that have absolutely stomped out every other alliance in the kingdom, and there's only one alliance left, cool, right? They're no problem because there's nobody to stand up to them. But if this is the defensive alliance and they're inviting new people in, or they, they did something to attract attention from another alliance, like maybe stealing rewards or getting greedy, you know, this is something that you'd, you'd wanna be looking into. Why the civil war started, what was the outcome, and if you think it'll happen again and it's just always it's always a good idea to keep your eyes peeled because they're you know in kingdoms with two or three uh equal powered alliances if there is a alliance that either came from another kingdom or started in that kingdom it was an aggressor you have to be sure that you know they brokered peace and it's not going to happen again or you know if it is going to happen again you know you don't want to go there yeah, and that, that kind of goes, a lot of the points that we've talked about so far are trying to decrease the odds of landing in a kingdom that's going to eventually a civil war, uh, because that that's the biggest waste of 
not only your resources and time but everybody's and then that just decreases your chances of kvk winning and if you don't win kvks then some people leave and so that's kind of like a, a snowball effect um and just going off of that point itself uh this is something that i wanted to add in there um just make sure that when you're when you're going to a new kingdom that it's got people there that you get along with people that you know maybe have the same sense of humor as you or they are participating in kingdom chat a lot um and i know like this is just from personal experience but if i didn't enjoy the people that i play with so much i probably would have stopped playing uh i actually started playing rise of kingdoms because co-workers of a mine started playing and so a lot of us played together and then a lot of them stopped playing but i continued playing because of the people that I actually met in the game which is really cool um, and there's really no way to honestly know this about a kingdom uh unless you start playing there and so the the best way to do that is to just make a new account in that kingdom uh talk to them in kingdom chat it's you don't have to care about that account you're basically just using it to gain access to those people and kind of um just see if you like those types of people and see if it's somewhere that you could see yourself investing in in those uh passport pages i i think that's an awesome point especially because it's it's something that like I, I personally, I like analytically look at a kingdom and look at its past and present, and that's how I generally decide. But looking at it, just if it's people that you click with and people that are friendly, I mean, obviously, there's more practical reasons to towards people that are friendly might tip you off about things. You know, they're probably less likely to get in civil wars, obviously, right. and you can just kind of get a, a general idea of the culture of the kingdom you're going to. Exactly. Good vibes all around. <laughs> um the next point that we wanted to talk about was having an active discord uh this is really really important um even just take rise of kingdoms out of it any professional esport or any professional gaming team or organization everyone uses discord if you're well organized right and so that applies to rise of kingdoms as well if if your kingdom has an active discord that's that's alive and you know there's there's a place for you to jump into a voice channel for ark of osiris or you know if you're in kvk you know that you can jump on discord hop in a voice call and say okay where do you guys want me uh, that's super super important and if the kingdom that you're trying to migrate to doesn't have a discord they don't know what discord is um that could be it could be a problem in the future just for keeping the kingdom alive but also for communication as well yeah i mean i, I think it's it's very like Ideally, you know, you'd want a uh, Discord where it's always popping and people are always talking to each other, bouncing ideas off, and it's social. But a as a bare minimum, you know, for for your Ark of Osiris's, you know, if it's a Farm Alliance Ark of Osiris, maybe people aren't in. It is what it is. But like, if you're in the Top Alliance, or God forbid, you're in OL and you don't have thirty people in that Discord, you know, there's major glaring issues with the kingdom. You know, communication. Even if they don't use Discord, if they're using something like TeamSpeak or Skype, I, I mean literally anything there just needs to be some form of communication yep 100 percent agree it's it's just another one of those signs it it just tells a lot about the kingdom the next point here was going to be over your power bracket this is especially important kvk2 uh for light versus darkness there are just so many people in the brackets that you know you have a general idea of where you're going but you sometimes don't know for sure you know if you're a high c kingdom you might just be a low b kingdom or if you're a low b kingdom you know you might get lucky and you're a high c kingdom but uh for kvk2 um there are i think 40 total people in your bracket. And so you actually know exactly where you're going to go for KVK2. So if you're migrating to a kingdom in KVK2, just make sure that they have an Excel spreadsheet. They know exactly what they're scouting. They know exactly how much they can get. And you know, if they're, they, they start deleting siege, it's probably a good kingdom, you know, but you just need to know that they're going to be organized and they're going to be looking uh, towards the KVK as their main goal and they're not just being stagnant you know you never want to ask them what uh if they're an a b c or d kingdom in kvk2 and they go uh i don't know that's not a good sign yeah and it's you know if they aren't uh snapping towards it and you you know you don't know if you're gonna win the kvk then you know you're gonna be looking a little 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 further down and seeing if there could be a chance of you getting uh any kind of mge you know if you're free to play t5 and you come into a kingdom that has no idea what it's doing um and they're going to lose kvk if you can get uh some some high-ranking saladin mges some high-ranking constantine mges it could be worth it you know just weigh your odds very carefully and if you're not t5 mge is probably not gonna be a factor in general uh it's more just for later players coming back earlier right yeah and that's like you said 
calculating it very specifically is important because the rewards fall off very fast in MGE. So you don't want to migrate thinking you're going to win uh, and then you walk away with 20 sculptures. So it doesn't feel good. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. Um, the last point we wanted to talk about is the age of the kingdom. Uh, so this is really important if you want to migrate and you're looking for specific commanders. So maybe you're an older player and you missed out on Constantine or you missed out on Saladin or even uh, an Alexander wheel. You don't want to spend all those universals. You'd rather migrate into a kingdom, spin the wheel a couple times, and then if you if you can, you can migrate out. That's something that you can do. Um, but knowing how old the kingdom is, is is really important because those are set times, right? A lot of people don't realize this, but uh, the wheel and the mightiest governor happen at set times, like set days in your kingdom. Um, and so being aware of that and knowing how far along they are is really going to help you in knowing what odds you're going to have at getting what commanders and what commanders are just gone. Like you just you can't get them in that kingdom until card king comes around yeah uh, like me specifically i found myself in a really tough spot because i missed the guan wheel for this kingdom i really enjoy this kingdom and you know we winning kvk made it uh overall not an issue if i if i didn't get the wheels or not but missing guan and overall like not being able to participate in leo really hurt it you know every single uh week seeing ramses or artemisia uh pass me by and then you know now i'm going to be seeing yss and theo i mean there's just nothing nothing glaring at me for a free-to-play player and you know if i had access to like an alex wheel or a guan wheel or a salad and mg you know it'd be it'd be awesome for me but I, I don't have it and that's something that if you guys aren't going to have it you need to be cognizant of what you're gaining if you're losing those wheels with that being said guys those are the 14 tips that we wanted you want the <laughs> With that being said, guys, those are the 14 tips that we wanted you to know about when you're looking for a new kingdom, some of the best things that you should be looking for. If you guys made it all the way to the end of the video, hopefully you guys will drop a thumbs up on it. It does help out the channel a ton. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new around here. Click that bell to be notified the next time that I upload a Rise of Kingdoms video. As always, links will be in the description to all my social media accounts, my Instagram, Twitter, uh, Discord, and Twitch. And as well, we're going to have all the social media links to 12-inch PvP Ness. So make sure you go over and check out all of his stuff down in the description below. Do you guys, uh, do you have anything you want to share with everyone out there? Yeah. So if you guys are ever looking to find me or ask me questions, I make a lot of God, I make a lot of God style content on YouTube, but I'm basically always live on Twitch. I stream about five to seven hours every single day. And that's going to be in the description below. And, you know, my Discord's going to be down there, too. That's the best place to reach me because I'm, you know, I try to read all the YouTube comments, but, you know, it's it's tough. I mean, they're, they're, they get to be quite a lot. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Cool. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. This has been Omniarch. I will talk to you guys again soon. Peace.